we're recording, so Catherine can begin. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I wanted to say welcome colleagues. I feel very honored to have the opportunity to address LAMA this year for the virtual annual conference. I wanna introduce myself as I'm a newbie to the Louisiana Archival community. Uh, even though I've only been in the club for about 13 months, I have already had the privilege and opportunity to meet many of you on the conference presentation, either in person or virtually, since half of those 13 months has been virtual land for all of us. Um, but so I'll begin with a brief introduction of myself and then we will move into the meat of the conversation. But most importantly, I would like to try to save some time at the end for some group discussion or collaboration on the, the questions that I'm gonna be posing um, during the presentation. So I'm gonna switch over to screen share now. Someone, if it doesn't work, please um, type up so I know. And, um, and then at the end, after the presentation, I'll come back on so that we can uh, have a chat. So here I'll go to screen share and should be up now. So prior to being named state archivist by Secretary of State Kyle Ardwin in uh, August of 2019, I was a practicing attorney in Baton Rouge. Um, my passion has uh, always been serving Louisianans in their pursuit for um, access to information and my legal career was diverse, including both government and private work. In the government sector, I served in several capacities over the years, including as a prosecutor under East Baton Rouge Parish District Attorney Hiller Moore, as an election compliance lawyer for East Baton Rouge Parish Clerk of Court, and for the Louisiana Supreme Court via special appointment for both complex class action litigation and capital punishment cases. But the thing um, in my career that I'm most proud of prior to becoming state archivist, of course, um, is that I, I have a determination at all times to provide access for Louisianians to the public records of the state of Louisiana. I've done that in many avenues, which included representing newspapers in pursuit of Freedom of Information Act claims uh, against the government and other private corporations, which ultimately led me to my career at the Louisiana State Archives, which will be our focus of our discussion today. I like to kind of throw that out there because oftentimes people think, what is this journalist lawyer doing at the archives, but um, it, it has a purpose and I'm really proud of being there and um, we've accomplished a lot over the last year and I have to tell you that the Louisiana State Archives is on the rise and so we're excited about what's going to happen next. Okay, so uh, challenges in 2020 have hit institutions across the country and the state uh, archives is no different. However, in 2019, new leadership at the state archives, mainly me, an outsider, brought some change and rustled some feathers, um, both organizationally and from a visionary perspective. Programmatic review, reorganization, and employee empowerment has catapulted the Louisiana State Archives into the now. I tried to use laser focus and combine that with a fresh perspective to allow for critical evaluation of our programs from the top to bottom, but I never forget that you don't know what you don't know. In keeping with that attitude, I have a great respect and appreciation for the veteran employees of the State Archives and the Louisiana Archival community, and of course, our national counterparts. Digging into their knowledge base while trying to bring some new perspective, the Louisiana State Archives team has created new goals and initiatives for the future. And boy, were we rocking and rolling. And then 2020, which has challenged us all in new ways. So many things, coronavirus, Hurricane Laura, and that's only to name a few of the dumbfounding anomalies of this year and the year's not over yet. But these events have reaffirmed the necessity for resilience. Reviewing past actions with a clear eye can truly help in laying the groundwork needed for nav navigating future paths. So let's talk change. It's a scary word sometimes, so I would like to rebrand it in another way. I'm calling it an invitation for advancement. So I'm gonna dive into some questions. A lot of my presentation will be some open-ended questions and that's what I'm hoping at the end we'll be able to talk more about. But 
These are the questions that I've been considering um, over the past year. How can you excel as a leader, an employee, a researcher, an archivist, or a librarian with your institution? How can you contribute to your institution? Do you provide institutional knowledge and perspective? Do you bring energy, new ideas? Are you physically able to assist where maybe others in your organization cannot? How can you cross train? What can you learn from your colleagues, other divisions or departments? I wanna stop for a moment and talk about that. I think that um, I can say this because a lot of my staff are on the call today, um, but I think that in, um, in our community of libraries and archives, um, many times people get into a specialty, which is very good and very important. But a lot of times people niche themselves into a specialty, which allow them or doesn't allow them to cross train with other people within the institution. And I think that that's a negative. So one of the things I've really tried to push is um, making people uncomfortable. So bringing us to the next thing, suggested challenges for to assist in reinvigoration of your staff, or if you're on staff, um, how to make yourself more excited about your daily work. Move people around, mix it up. And I mean literally move people around. Make people uncomfortable a little bit. You'll really learn a lot about people's strengths and weaknesses when you take the time to challenge them. Challenge yourself with training. Learn new software, new programs, new processes within your organization. You'd be really surprised how much you have at your fingertips with um, software or programs that you already have within your institution that some people just haven't taken the time to learn. And so instead of thinking that you don't have money for a new program or you don't have money for new training, sometimes just digging into something that you already have will make you realize that you have capabilities within your organization that you had no idea. So um, change the environment, change your workspace, change job assignments, temporarily assist in other departments. Those are just a few ways that don't cost any money, but allow you to learn new things. No money, no problem. Sometimes it costs zero money to have programmatic change with lasting impacts. And with the current financial outlook, we were chatting about this just right before we started the presentation is, yeah, everyone's doing virtual this year, but what's going to happen next year, Sharon was saying, uh, with conferences next year and seminars, if, if we get huge budget cuts, any of us that are funded by the state, um, then that's going to be a huge problem, not only for this year, but years to come. And so, and it's not just about being able to attend the conferences that you want to attend. It, we might be facing budget cuts for technology, for new resources, for uh, outreach to our customers. And so I really want people to realize that there are some things that you can do um, without money and we better be ready because it's probably going to be cut. Um, and we know that especially the historical institutions and, and others are probably going to be hit pretty hard. Um, and I would encourage all of you to look into the different grants that are available. I know that we've been trying to tap into that as well. So keep an eye out for those. Catherine, you're muted. I don't know how that happened, but. It, it, was it right when I switched the happy face slide? Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll start happy face slide over. I, I, um, I said that uh, I know I have several people from the archives on the call, and so they, they might chuckle at this a little bit. I think I might have been annoying to some people the first six months or so that I became state archivist because uh, I kept repeating something over and over again. And before I say it, they're gonna know what it is. Just be pleasant and productive, pleasant and productive. Um, stressing that over and over and over though, I think did actually make people more pleasant and productive. Um, and there's no doubt that there's an attitude shift uh, with us. I think everybody can see it and feel it. And so uh, sometimes if you just will yourself into a different attitude, I don't mean for this to seem like some kind of um, 
presentation on being happy or motivational speaking. But I think that given our current environment and what we've all been dealing with the last six months or so, um, it is good to take a moment to step back and give perspective back to what it is that we're doing. Hmm. I'm trying to click over. Hold on one second. We're just going to stay on happy face forever. Okay, so individual empowerment is vitally important for organizational success as well. If you're a supervisor, are you talking with your employees individually as a section or as a leadership team? Is this happening weekly? Is it happening monthly? Are you setting performance goals for your section or for your team? Do you task employees to other sections or jobs? How are you as an executive communicating with your supervisors in your larger, larger organization? I'm going to pause right there for a second because one of the things that we as the state archives being a division of the Secretary of State's office has realized that it's not just about your top down leadership, um, but it's also your top up leadership, meaning being an advocate for your institution to your larger organization. So if you're a part of a university, for instance, it's not just about your library at your university. It's about your relationship as the archivist or as an employee at that library, making sure that you are having constant communication with the president or the board or whoever is your governing organization. And so um, you need to make sure that those people know your face and they know your name. Um, because when funding issues come up or wanting more spots, you know, more, wanting more staff, uh, you have to make sure that they know who you are and then have a positive uh, experience about what you're doing for that organization to draw attention to um, the archives or the museum or library or whoever you might be working for. If you're an employee, are you willing and volunteering to learn about other sections? So I've heard a lot of, oh yeah, I'm, I'm willing to help anytime, just let me know. But when you are swamped and you're in the thick of a project and you're completely overwhelmed, a lot of times it's hard to think about, oh, I remember so-and-so said anytime they're willing to help me. But it's that person who goes out of their way to constantly be volunteering for other projects. Those are the people who rise to the top. Don't just wait to be told that you're needed. If you see a need, jump in and help. Um, so how are you relaying to your supervisor the needs of your section, both professionally or from a customer service perspective? We are all in the customer service industry because we're providing information to the public. Um, and the public could be colleagues that you work with within your institution. Am I literally mean the public if you have a library? Um, a lot of us deal with public records requests, and that's important. And so I've told my team to think about us completely as customer service representatives for the state of Louisiana. Um, and some of those customers will be, like I said, the public who comes to our public research library. And then some of it will just be other agencies who are calling us for information. So I, I like to hit home with that. Why is all this positive talk? so important. Why am I giving this motivational speech here? It's because of 2020. It's because what we've experienced as a team in the past year was that we must engage in long range planning, which includes education, self and team development. It's about your daily operations or said another way. How is your organization running day in and day out? That really allows an organization to respond quickly to changing dynamics. If you don't have a healthy communication channel in place with your organization and with your team members, then stay at home orders, working from home situations, weather closures, or the changing COVID protocols, which none of us can seem to keep up with, are not going to miraculously make your communication system within your organization better. It's going to make it worse. So we are now all probably used to communicating via chat and internet. We're communication experts. 
with what we've had to deal with in 2020. But it's a good time to take a step back and evaluate your communication channels and styles as well. So communication considerations. How are your communication channels set up? What are they? Do you communicate with your colleagues or coworkers via text? Is it always email? Do you pick up the phone and call them? Are you using the most effective method of disseminating your message that you're trying to convey? So use all types of communication. If it's something that needs to be uh, solidified and be referenced in the future, don't call someone. You need to put that in an email. If you maybe don't want it to be, <laughs> then maybe put it in a text or in a phone call. But if you're a government employee, your texts are subject to public record requests, just so you know. Um, but make sure that you're communicating with your team, not just frequently, but in the best manner. Don't underestimate the importance of putting things in writing so that people can reference them again in the future. Do you have trust and open communication with your operations and your staff? Um, like I said, I just want to reiterate that I'm going to be putting a lot more questions out and so feel free to drop them in the chat so um, we can get those at the end. If you have any examples of something that was successful or not successful for you during COVID or during this time, or if you have any questions for me, just put it in the chat. So communication issues do not have to live only in large organizations. A broken line of communication can ultimately have a big effect in your organization's success. At the Louisiana State Archives, how do we measure success? The success of an organization can be broken down in different ways, but we have both our large and our small organization, as I alluded to um, earlier. Just in case you don't know, I'll just put it on the screen. I think Catherine froze. I was just going to say, I'm not sure if that was for me or not. Uh, Catherine, if you can hear us. Is anyone else having that issue? Please speak up in the chat. Okay. Oh, that's all right. All right. So I was just saying, I was, I was letting everyone know that there are several different divisions of the archives and that's some of the things that we do there. Um, but so it's not just a simple undertaking. It's not what, uh, what we want to stress that none of your organizations are simple undertakings, even if it's small or larger than the state archives, but being a part of archival records. Um, I'm trying to get to the next slide. I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know what, there we go. That, that's me being overwhelmed right there. Uh, so it doesn't matter if your organization is big or small, whether you're a government, private, nonprofit, or educational, the obligation to preserve and make records accessible to the public is a huge undertaking. So what does this all mean? Remember, COVID, hurricanes, and just life. Preparing for the worst, who would have thought about 2020? So my thoughts on where we are now and how you prepare on where we are now. How would we have, if we could have gone back, how would we have said that we would prepare for a pandemic? Well, you, you can't. There is just too much. And when, a, a, when a, a disaster is going on or a pandemic is going on, honestly, the very last thing is you think, oh, let me go to my disaster preparedness booklet and, and go to page 75 and figure out what I'm supposed to do in this situation. People just panic. Livelihoods, homes, offices, and records are being destroyed. So what's important? What is the most important thing? The most important thing is to have open lines of communication in place in order to affect change to the plan as the circumstances change. change. Retask, repurpose. No one should feel that they're not being utilized to their fullest potential potential. 
what service can you be providing that you're not as an agency or an individual cross train i mean literally like i said move people around yes it will interrupt the flow of daily operations however the weakest the weakest position in an organization is for one person to be the only person who knows how to do a job no one or perhaps everyone is replaceable and that's what COVID taught us we've seen how self-isolation or quarantine can send an organization into complete halt if everything in an organization is dependent on one person who knows how to do the job um, so these are just some things to keep in mind so ask yourself who is your number two uh, in your organization always be thinking about who would be able to step in if you're not available this includes anything from a short-term sickness to a long-term absence or even retirement. So how are you assisting and settling your organization up for success or absent? Take pride in your work and your contributions to your organization and don't let your job simply be about a paycheck. At this point, um, at that point, if that's the case, then you're really part of your organization's problem. So the bottom line is that you will respond in the same manner during a crisis as you operate on a daily basis. So what will your response be? What will your response be? How will you be effective communicator? How will you get a good grasp on your ability to affect change in a situation? Do you have open lines of communication with the players who affect the most changes in the shortest amount of time? How can your team adapt to receive or provide assistance to your customers, other agencies, or employees in need. Um, like I said, I posed a lot of questions during this time, and I want to um, encourage you guys to, to just say that it's been a hard couple of months, but I know that we are coming out of it. I'm so pleased to be such a, a part of such a wonderful organization like the Louisiana State Archives and the Louisiana Archival Community. I know we have about five minutes left so if we want to um take any questions or open up the chat then i'd be happy to do that so thank you so much i appreciate y'all allowing me to talk today to everybody uh, thank you for your presentation catherine um I, I really like what you said about us being public service because we really are and i think that goes um un unmentioned or unnoticed in a lot of other professions but yeah if anyone has questions please put them in the chat and we will get to them in order um, i know mary lynn put some text some recommended text in the chat mary lynn do you want to talk to us a little bit about those or no one has questions right the um the louisiana uh, Historical Association is moving forward with um, saving the archives and we've also worked with, uh, with uh, Laura, Dr. Laura McLemore and I did a presentation on uh, advocacy on archives and um, so we uh, were very much uh, and I'm very much attuned to changing uh, professions myself because I was a abstractor, went back to school, worked in the state archives. How are the, um, the how's the uh, state uh, records historical board doing these days, Catherine? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. So we got uh, new legislation back in 2018. Um, and since we did not have a state archivist until I came um, for many years, until I came in 2019, there wasn't really anybody spearheading the, or the operation of getting that board together. So in January of this year, we got some, we have the board now, uh, and we were scheduled to start doing our meetings and then COVID happened. <laughs> and so it's been a real challenge. Actually, the State Archives has four different boards we, uh, that I'm, I manage. Um, we have the Louisiana Historical Records Advisory Board. We have the, uh, the Friends, which is the nonprofit. Then we have the Advisory Board for the Louisiana State Archives. And then I also sit on the boards for all of the museums that are under the Secretary of State's office. And so I am behind the ball for sure on getting all of those boards um, meeting back up. But as of now, we're not allowed to have any kind of 
public meetings at the state archives yet. We're allowing small internal meetings, but I'd like to try to get everybody together in person, which is why I had been waiting, but it looks like we're probably gonna have to go forward with calling the meeting via Zoom. So that should happen for sure before the end of the year. But my hope is that we'll get everything reinvigorated and started, but we have it fully appointed and confirmed by the Senate and we're ready to go. Okay, um, if there are, you know, if any, anyone has any questions, this is your last chance. I just wanted to, again, thank uh, Catherine for appearing uh, with us today. Uh, this is really a great start uh, for a good uh, collaboration between our two organizations. And I was just wondering uh, if you see any, um, how to phrase this, uh, would the, the state archives a role in uh, guiding the archival leadership community, the archival professional community, um, how you see that um, unfolding? Yeah, uh, absolutely. The great thing about what's happening at the state archives is we have a lot of new people coming in. Um, and I don't necessarily just mean young people. I just mean we've hired a lot of new people. Um, so we have a really great balance right now of our veteran employees who um, have been with us 15, 20, some, some upward of 25 years. And then we have a lot of staff that are five years and less. And so the reason why I think that's a great positive is because uh, we have an opportunity to transfer institutional knowledge. Um, and then with some of our not just new employees, but some of the younger employees who are fresh out of library school or you know, some kind of IT program. Um, there's a collaboration, not only of institutional knowledge coming down, but new fresh book knowledge or computer knowledge going back up. So I think that what's happening with the staff is a great collaboration and a great example of how we can, as the state archives, also be a way to collaborate cross other institutions. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're not ready to spearhead the march because we're still working out, you know, our own internal kinks, but we're really excited about how we're going to be able to be a huge participant in the Louisiana archival community in the next coming year. So. Well, fantastic. Um, I, just a little bit of history and, and Lana has really uh, stepped into for, for that spearheading. So I only say that to take pressure off. We are not expecting you to jump in and lead us. Um, yeah. We enjoy the collaborative process. I think I'm speaking for many of our members. If, and if I'm not, pardon me, sorry members, but I can't imagine that we would feel otherwise. So yeah. um, we, we are here to be partners for sure. Absolutely, well, we're super excited. Thank you. Okay, uh, and thank you so much everyone. We are a little bit over, but I hope everyone can join us again for session four in about 15 minutes. And um, thank you again, Catherine, for presenting. And uh, thanks everyone for showing up. <laughs>